in a sharp break with tradition, we are going to start on time this evening. Well, welcome all to our second Read the Revolution for, uh, I want to say this semester or this, this year. Um, very excited. I think we are breaking a record here for Read the Revolution tonight. There are, what, 75 people online from literally across the nation. Those of you who are tuning in, uh, make sure you use the chat function in um, Zoom and like tell us where you're from. Make sure you put some questions in there because we'll have an opportunity um, to you know, ask a few of those questions later on in the evening. Um, so we're here, of course, to talk about Sam Adams, but just a few, um, few logistics uh, beforehand. Um, I want to make a pitch to those of you who are here in the room and those of you online to not miss our upcoming special exhibition. We're just a couple weeks from opening Witness to Revolution, The Unlikely Travels of Washington's Tent. Now, it's okay for you to raise your hand if I ask, how many of you have shed a little tear or felt a certain feeling in the Washington Tent Theater? It's okay, you can, you can admit it. You are not actually the first ones, or even the first generation. Um, one of the stories that we couldn't tell, because I was told I only had 12 minutes, um, you know, and when Tolkien was being translated by Peter Jackson, right? Do you all remember Tom Bombadil? Very important person in the book, did not make it into the movie. So the Tom Bombadil of the Washington Tent story is a man by the name of the Marquis de Lafayette. Uh, there's one in every crowd. <laughs> and you're not really even French, are you? Oui? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> All of my college French has just left my brain, Karen. We are on the cusp of the 200th anniversary of Lafayette's return on the 50th, 50 years after the Revolutionary War, on the eve of the 50th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence. And in 1824, Lafayette visited our fair city here in Philadelphia, processed right down Chestnut Street, past where we're, we're standing here. 4,000 people gathered in the Chestnut Street Theater for a dinner celebrating the nation's guest. Um, the Frank Johnson's band played all night long. He headed down and his next stop was Baltimore in Maryland. And he got onto a steamship and came up, came up the, uh, the Patapsco River and arrived at Fort McHenry. Now, something had recently happened at Fort McHenry, right? There had been a big flag waving that we sing about before all those sporting events. And that flag was flying over Fort McHenry to greet Lafayette. The state militia had gathered on the, on the parade ground and had formed themselves in a line. And as the Lafayette alights from this steamship and walks up into the fort, very dramatic, the soldiers part their ranks. And there, set up on the parade ground of Fort McHenry, Underneath the Star Spangled Banner is Washington's tent. It's 22 feet below where you're sitting right now is where it actually lives uh, today. And it got better than that because underneath that tent was a group of surviving officers who had served with Lafayette as young men. Now, uh, 50 years later, uh, from the Society of the Cincinnati, Charles Carroll, who would be the last surviving signer of the Declaration of Independence under that tent, and those men wept like babies underneath that canvas. Um, that night there was a dinner in Baltimore. John Quincy Adams, who as a nine-year-old boy had scampered up onto the roof of his house with his mother Abigail to listen to the far-off sound of gunshots and cannon from the Battle of Bunker Hill. So he was also a veteran of the Revolutionary War. Um, and he gave a toast that night to tears of glory, gratitude, and joy under the tent of Washington. So that is the story that we're bringing back here for this bicentennial of Lafayette crying under the tent. You will see objects that have been separated, objects from Washington's Revolutionary Field headquarters, the bed that he actually slept in in the tent, Martha Washington's traveling trunk that she went back and forth to camp every year through the Revolutionary War, a folding camp stool, if anyone's watching from L.L. Bean, America's earliest camping equipment, uh, <laughs> made actually right here a block from where we're sitting at the uh, sign of the easy chair in Plunkett Fleeson's upholstery shop at uh, 4th and Chestnut Streets. Those objects, which were all together, 
during the Revolutionary War have been separated since Martha Washington died in 1802 and are coming back in the museum um, for witness to revolution that you'll see um, all together. We brought back fragments of the tents which were cut up and given away as souvenirs in the 19th century are all being brought back together. Uh, just saw the wall today, absolutely. You wouldn't think just a bunch of canvas on a wall would really kind of get you, but I promise it will. So anyway, I don't want to oversell uh, and under deliver, but trust me, this is going to be uh, just another Another really great blockbuster exhibit at the museum. So please uh, make sure you join us. Those of you who are members, you have been greeted uh, with uh, uh, an invitation to join us for the opening um, uh, events in two weeks. And uh, it's a great inducement, and there's still time to join and become a member of the museum. For those of you who are online, what you're missing, um, for those of you who are here, is an opportunity to see a couple of objects from the collection that are on display here. Um, we always try to have a little, little intersection with the theme of the speech by bringing a few objects out. We have on the right um, an original Philadelphia printing of the Journal of the Proceedings of Congress. This is the, the first Continental Congress. Uh, we have it opened up appropriately to the uh, list of participants that includes Samuel Adams. And on the left, a pair of shoe buckles on a loan to us from direct descendants of um, Samuel Adams. And according to family tradition, are the shoe buckles that he wore um, uh, when the Declaration of Independence was adopted here in Philadelphia. So feel the presence of the past. Now, I'm really excited to um, welcome Tony Nacarado, who is, where are you, Tony? Uh, to talk a little bit about our partners, uh, the Carpenters Company. We're sort of the new kids in the block here in Philadelphia. These guys are celebrating their 300th anniversary this year, and then much later, uh, you know, going to talk about the First Continental Congress as well. So anyway, please, uh, Tony. Thank you, Scott. Good evening, everyone. I'd like to add my welcome to this uh, wonderful evening, this fantastic building, uh, and everything that it, uh, that it stands for here uh, in our great city. But yes, I am, uh, I'm a structural engineer by day. Uh, my firm was founded here by, by my father in, 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 here in Philadelphia, and it's still headquartered here in Philadelphia. Um, but I am also serving this year as the president of the Carpenters Company. Uh, very proudly uh, serving in our anniversary year. As Scott mentioned, uh, our guild is the oldest professional guild in the United States, formed in 1724 uh, by those master builders who had come to America uh, and basically uh, were charged with constructing our country, building uh, those edifices that we, you know, today uh, honor. Uh, and, and, and support. And our little edifice there, uh, Carpenters Hall, is a building that we are incredibly proud of. Uh, our members here tonight uh, are, 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 uh, are joining me tonight to, to celebrate you know, our company, yes, but also the fact that that little building uh, was, was, was a place where I, I think, I think uh, Mr. McCullough said, it was the, uh, the acorn of American democracy. Uh, the first Continental Congress was held there in uh, 1774 in total secret <laughs> because at that time, talking about overthrowing uh, England would have been met with, I'm sure, uh, discouragement, discouragement <laughs> is, a, is, 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 is certainly a euphemism that, uh, that's appropriate. So uh, we have the dual, uh, honor of, of uh, being able to, again, recognize our company and all that we have and all of our members have contributed to the built environment here in, in Philadelphia in particular, but, but elsewhere throughout the United States, the early United States. And then we will also celebrate uh, this wonderful beginning of the celebration that we will uh, all embark on a couple of years from now, right, the, the, the bigger, the bigger uh, event. Um, we have a lot of events going on throughout the year. We are so proud to be partnering with Scott and with the, the, the folks here. Uh, we have a little event that we're going to pull off in, uh, in, over the summer called the Young Persons Continental Congress. And we are bringing high school students from the original 13 colonies back to Philadelphia to talk about today and the issues surrounding America 
today, which we all know are uh, pretty interesting to say the least, right? An interesting time in our country. So, uh, and we'll be proud to have some events here, Scott. So thank you again for, uh, for doing that. Of course, Stacy uh, Schiff, uh, who we're gonna hear from soon, she has uh, been connected to the company since we formed uh, and initiated our prize for American history, our uh, Amarcala Prize for American history. She has served on that committee, so thank you very much. Uh, Stacy for that and uh, buckle up I think it's going to be a great uh, a, a great uh, event tonight thank you Scott thank you for giving me an opportunity uh, to just say a few words and again I want to thank my uh, my fellow company members and I'd make a special uh, acknowledgement to our previous president Howard Liebold who's sitting here in the front row uh, Howard had the distinction of coming into office uh, just as we learned that we had an arsonist uh, attack our building on Christmas Eve. And so uh, Howard, uh, through his leadership, uh, was able to not only get our building open again, but get it open by the 4th of July and uh, have it ready now in all its splendor for uh, our upcoming celebration. So again, thank you very much. It's a, such a blessing to be literally right across the street from Carpenter's Hall. Um, I heard David McCullough say many times, it's a place where you, you feel the presence of the past. He would talk about the ghosts. You know, he could see and feel the ghosts uh, walking these streets around here. So it's a, been a wonderful partnership. Um, Stacy Schiff, who is actually the reason why you all came here tonight, uh, is... Um, uh, really doesn't require much of an introduction, so I'm not going to go and read a long, lengthy um, list of works and achievements, but just to say that um, I have been studying American history pretty much since I was a kid. Um, went to graduate school, spent a lot of time studying the American Revolution, and um, Samuel Adams was not somebody that I felt like I had a feeling of a, of a real person, and it is such a, a testimony to a great biographer, and Stacy Schiff is one of the greatest biographers um, here uh, working today, to bring alive a character who's so important, um, Samuel Adams. And so I'm going to welcome Stacy up to the stage for some conversation. We're going to chat a little bit. We'll see what comes out, and we're going to definitely have time for you all to help guide the conversation uh, by asking some questions, and those of you in the audience as well. So come on up, Stacy. They're waiting for you. Wanted to make sure I got mine signed first, so. Might do that. <laughs> so you can start a story like in all sorts of places, right? At the beginning and go back or the middle and in the end. And I thought because of Carpenter's Hall, I feel like that's, First Continental Congress is kind of like maybe the middle of the story. Would you, is that fair? You know, interestingly, it's almost the end of the story for Adams, mm -hmm. but, I, but I'll start wherever you like. Yeah, so let's pretend it's the actual okay. middle. Okay, all right. Um. <laughs> so yeah, so who's a, uh, who is this dude that rolls into Philadelphia for the first time? And um, Let me just start by saying thank you to the museum and um, to Carpenter's Company on their anniversary to that great acorn, and thank you all for coming out. Um, if you spend too long in the 18th century, I think you forget how close New York and Philadelphia are. So um, <laughs> thank you for bringing me down here tonight. Um, Adams is an unlikely hero in many ways. And actually, let's start with the shoe buckles. That's where we should start. Yeah, sure. Because they, they actually they make their way to Philadelphia in an interesting way. Adams is a sort of um, young idealist who never has a profession, which is one of the more interesting things about him. He's a man who lives on ideas. And those tend early on to be ideas that are antithetical to the crown, which we can get into. Um, but he's very much the leader of the opposition movement in Boston, but also a somewhat disheveled figure in the streets of Boston, um, doesn't really care about um, any kind of appearance or finery. He really lives f to speak about politics and to ponder ideas and to write tirelessly against the crown. So when it comes time for him to be sent to Philadelphia to- So are you saying the John Fetterman of 1776? <laughs> <laughs> oh, what a thought. <laughs> Does John Fetter? Well, we'll get into that in a minute. Um, I'm just thinking. Hoodie. Sorry, John. I'm, I'm just from thinking Pittsburgh, like by the way. Hoodie and Samuel Adams. I'm just trying to get past that. But but you make an interesting point because when it comes time for Samuel Adams and the Massachusetts delegation to make their way to Philadelphia, 
it is um, pretty much understood in Boston that Mr. Adams might be a little bit of an embarrassment to the delegation in the eyes of the Philadelphians and the rest of the, um, of, of the colonies, in fact. And so at the Adams household one night, just before his departure for Philadelphia, arrives a tailor um, who is there to take Mr. Adams's measure while the Adams family are sitting at dinner and doesn't reveal who has sent him, but takes Adams's measure for a new suit of clothes. And then shortly thereafter, there's another anonymous, there's another knock at the door by a wig maker who also was sent anonymously to take Mr. Adams's measure. And you can see where this is going. It's kind of a fairy tale procession of, of professions, including someone who sent very beautiful shoe buckles and a cloak. And a week later arrived on Mr. Adams's doorstep um, a trunk with all of his new finery in it so that he could make his trip to Philadelphia without embarrassing the Massachusetts Bay Colony. <laughs> so I think it's great that you have the, belt, the, bu the buckles here. Absolutely, yeah. So um, it's a good place maybe to go back then um, to a little bit about what, where Adams uh, sort of originates because there's been, um, I think you do a good job of sort of pointing out the ways Adams has been viewed by different generations of historians like since the 18th century. And, um, you know, if, you know, at one point you would have thought of him as just a brawler who came up, you know, out of the streets. Uh, yeah, pretty yeah, much he so, was a yeah, brawler well, until he was a beer. And then, <laughs> right, and then it was all over, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but he was, he was not born into poverty by any means, although I think uh, it, it, really it was said that he cared little about having or possessing money, right, throughout his life, but that's not really his background, so. Which is odd for a Bostonian, because it's a very industrious, aspirational, ambitious town. And moreover, it's a hard place to live when you don't have a, an income, which he somehow manages to do, I think, largely thanks to handouts from, from John Hancock, which we can talk about. But what differentiates him from um, so many of the founders, and from so many people, for that matter, um, at that moment in history, is that he is very much, he's born, to, he's born to great wealth. He grows up in a, in a huge house overlooking Boston Harbor. Um, his father is very prosperous until an act of parliament essentially ruins the family um, while Adams is at Harvard. And so Adams has a first-rate education. He has a BA and a master's degree from Harvard. Um, is very much familiar to the Massachusetts elite. But at the same time, because he has no profession, because he very much considers himself a man of the people, because his first job is a market clerk in Boston, which was an unusual job for someone of his background, he's very familiar with the men on the wharves, the shopkeepers, the innkeepers, um, the artisans of Boston. So he really has this rather astonishing ability to connect the high and the low. And you know, we talk about this with the revolution, you know, which was it top down or was it bottom up? He's able to connect both of those worlds. And it's a very hierarchical world, in fact. I think we forget how, especially in New England, how much the hierarchy mattered and how much people who were not of the merchant elite resented the merchant elite. And you see a lot of that um, with Adams toward Thomas Hutchinson, the royal governor. You see it, obviously, toward many of the opposition leaders with the crown officers in Boston. So what are his, um, when does he start to sort of step onto the political stage. So early on, he, um, he founds a newspaper with friends in the 1740s, which is a very short-lived enterprise, but it establishes him as an extremely fluent writer. And over the next years, um, somewhat under the tutelage of James Otis, he will write pieces on behalf of other people. And he, in fact, is recruited by the Massachusetts um, House of Representatives to write a response to the Crown during the, during the Stamp Act crisis, even though he is not yet a member of the Massachusetts House, because he's just known for the fact, for, his, for the clarity, really, of his prose, which really does ring off the page. There are these anthems to what we will consider to be founding principles, but are not yet um, really entirely articulated elsewhere in many of his, of his early essays. And it is through that um, channel that he ends up getting elected to the Massachusetts House, um, where he immediately makes a mark, um, I think in two ways primarily. One is that in the opinion of the, the royal governor and the lieutenant governor, suddenly the Massachusetts House is a much less polite place. And they speak with a much, much more brusque voice than they had spoken with before Adams's election to the House. So he really, there's a fiber um, to, the, to the opposition effort that he introduces into the assembly. And the other is that he with friends arranges for a gallery to be built in the Massachusetts House. 
And this is like putting cameras in Congress. The feeling was that the people should be able to see their elected officials in action. And this is um, anathema, obviously, to the Thomas Hutchinsons of this world who don't understand why the people should have any place um, in the House and who think that, who basically write it off as a kind of theater that Adams and his friends have, con have concerted. Um, and they're particularly peeved that Adams and his friends invite their friends to occupy the gallery. So um, they find this to be um, a pretty objectionable measure. And it's very typical of Adams, the man, that he just felt that everyone should be folded into the political process. And at this point, is he, um, would you say he's leading from the front? Is he leading from the back? How is he, uh, how is he able to kind of build the, that network and the machine that will become so important in the 1760s? I feel like so much of your answer is like lost in a smoky back room somewhere. Um, no, I don't think he's leading yet. And, it, and what ha it's interesting what happens. James Otis is really... I, I would say pretty much the, the, the greatest incendiary in the minds of the Crown officers in Boston at this point. Adams is sort of his colleague and his associate, but he hasn't really made his mark yet. And only by like 1768 or so does Adams seem to be leading the parade. And we know that not because Adams claims credit for anything or puts his name on anything because his writing obviously is under pseudonyms and an army of pseudonyms. I'm counting at least 32 or 34 and I'm sure there are others that have escaped me. Um, but we know this because of the diligent correspondence that Francis Bernard, the royal governor, and Thomas Hutchinson, the lieutenant governor, and later the royal governor, send back to London. And that's really where you can read the history of the work of Samuel Adams, in fact, because they are able to, in a way, Adams couldn't assign credit for Adams's, the gallery, for example, for Adams's um, movements and for Adams, there's a lot of quoted material in those letters. And you can really see how Adams is kind of pivoting around town and drawing people together, both in opposition to the Townsend Acts or writing letters to um, various, various British officials in objection to the Townsend Acts. Um, and it's attempting really to bring the people of New England and ultimately the colonies all together on to the same page by forging a kind of common vocabulary and a common grammar. And I should just say that the danger of reading of his activities in the letters of his enemies, of course, is that he gets often credit for things he didn't do. So um, Francis Bernard in particular will very closely read the Boston Gazette, which was the chief paper for which Adams is writing and the most read paper in Boston. And he, and he would send, he would pull the columns that he thought were the most seditious out and send them back to London, basically saying, can you please just arrest this man already? And he started, at one point, he started with, you know, labeling them A, B, C, and he was at W within like two weeks because there was so much of this material. But some of those columns, um, which Francis Bernard mails back to London, were not written by Adams, in fact. So he, he often does get credit, more credit than was due, but at other times he can be um, seen best in those materials. So can you, um, can we talk a little bit about where he is in his sort of family life and because he's a little older than many of the revolutionaries who will step onto the stage, not as old as Benjamin Franklin, but um, um, so yeah, so wh what has happened uh, at home while all of this is going on? <laughs> Yeah, so he's in that sort of intermediate. He's old enough to be James Madison or Alexander Hamilton's father, essentially. He's 14 years older than John Hancock. I think, he, if I'm if remembering correctly, 12 years older than John Adams, whom he recruits. And that, is, and that really is one of the other chief contributions in addition to this forging of a vocabulary and a movement. He's an extraordinary recruiter of talent. And because he's a little bit older, um, the adage in Boston went that if you gave the the wisdom of Boston was that if you gave the best commencement address at Harvard commencement, Samuel Adams would be on your doorstep the next morning. And so there are any number of young men, John Hancock included, whom he does bring into the movement. So that's partly what he's doing in these years. He's, he's married twice in answer to your question about the home life, um, has several children, goes for quite a long time between the two marriages, um, goes for seven years, which was almost unthinkable in um, Boston at the time. I think Paul Revere went for seven months between marriages. Um, so he's a single parent in those years and very much prides himself on um, the raising of his children and the education of his children. And I should say, by the way, he's very um, interested in girls' education. When, later, when he's, he's, he's a huge proponent, as are all of the founders, obviously, of public schools and public schooling. And 
education being a pillar of democracy, but it is always boys and girls. In, ev in everything he writes, it's always both genders. And there's um, early evidence of his uh, feelings about slavery also early in his family life also as well. It, it appears to have been a New England custom that if you were, could afford it, a suitable wedding present on, on, on a, a couple's marriage was to send them a slave. And Adams is actually former mother-in-law tries to send a slave to the household when, when he remarries. And Adams basically says, not acceptable. Um, if she's free, she's welcome to come live with us, but she, I will not live with, a, with an enslaved person in my household. And that's an opinion that he clearly holds through the 1760s when there are a number of um, attempts made at some kind of abolition bill in Massachusetts. Obviously, all, they all sputter out, but all of those people write to Adams to include him to see if he can perhaps see that something is done about the slave trade. So it's clear where his sympathies lie, but obviously none of those efforts gains any traction. So can you sort of sketch out, um, you know, you've got basically a, a decade stretching from the Stamp Act to the outbreak of war and Adam's sort of growth from, you know, local leader and his reputation sort of growing uh, partly through the correspondence of his enemies writing home. But just sort of talk about the expansion of uh, uh, people's awareness of Samuel Adams and like the way he was perceived, you know, not just across the sea, but then through the colonies. Like by the time he arrives here for the First Continental Congress, sort of who knows about him? How do they know that? And um, what do they think about him? Let me, let me go backwards. By the time he arrives with those glorious buckles on his shoes, um, he's known as the greatest rascal firebrand um, opponent of the crown in the colonies, um, has established quite a reputation for himself to the point where um, when he arrives in Philadelphia and Congress assembles, there is the Samuel Adams of Georgia, the Samuel Adams of North Carolina, um, every other Samuel Adams of Rhode Island, all the other colonies who have a person who's way out in front in a radical way is generally compared to Adams. Um, a lot of that reputation rests on some of the street theater in Boston, some of the non-importation efforts, um, some of the wrangling behind the scenes to um, make clear that the colonists are going to oppose any form of taxation. But a great deal of it rests on the propaganda that Adams and his friends turn out in these years. And probably the best example of that is um, Boston in 1768 will be occupied by redcoats, and that's, I think that's earlier than most of us remember because we think of the Boston Massacre, but, but in fact it's October of 1768 when troops first march into Boston. And shortly thereafter, Adams and some enterprising friends begin this kind of syndicated news service called the Journal of Occurrences in which they concoct these really lurid, salacious pieces about um, the marauding British soldiers. And they send these dispatches. It's always, you know, muskets in the chest and knives in the back and old women being attacked at home while reading the Bible. I mean, it's, it's page six stuff, basically. And they, and they form this kind of new syndicate where they send these items south, first to Philadelphia where they're printed, I'm um, sorry, first to New York and then to Philadelphia. And then the stories make their way back to Boston several weeks later, by which time it's unclear if any of these things actually happened. Um, so there's this wonderfully, and this drove Thomas Hutchinson wild, by the way, because none of this material, or very little of it anyway, had any basis in fact. But because it appeared in the Boston Gazette very often or in the Boston Evening Post, most people believed it. So it was Hutchinson's feeling that nine-tenths of this was fiction and everyone was falling for it, something we, of course, have no understanding of today whatsoever. <laughs> um, so, that, so that really, and, and it's pretty clear that most people in Boston know who's behind a lot of this, a lot of this press. Fast forward to 1770 and the Boston Massacre, it is Adams really on the barricades in a way at trying to organize, first of all, trying to control the narrative of the story of what actually happened that night. And a curious thing about that night, of course, is that I think there are 92 accounts and very few of them um, in any way coincide. I mean, the moon isn't even in the same place in most of the accounts. So getting that material back to London faster than anyone else, at which he fails, I should add, and then trying somehow to see to it that the trials are held quickly when the town is still riled up and when things still feel very heated and when tempers are flaring. And he also fails at that. Um, what he doesn't fail at is that he 
probably is the person who sees to it that John Adams, his younger cousin and a brilliant lawyer, defends the soldiers, sees to it that all but two of them are acquitted of murder that evening, which does not stop Samuel Adams from then spending six months relitigating the entire case in the press and basically making it seem as if Boston was in the right and the soldiers were in the wrong. So he's really on the map for these kinds of things, as well as for, in, in, in that entire process, folding the entire town of Boston, and in fact, much of New England in many ways, into the political process. He's very good involving women and children. Um, many of these Journal of Occurrences pieces, because the non-importation effort was very important in that year, um, are about the, the, the brilliant, heavenly women of New England who have spinning contests and how much, how much fabric they have each produced and how they are being more patriotic, in fact, than their husbands. Um, that there are these great pay-ins to the women of New England for their work. So he's really kind of folding everyone in this very canny way into the process, um, almost inventing what we would today consider civil resistance theory from just instinctive understanding. Can you talk a little bit about the committees of correspondence? I know it's you know, well described in the book. It's just, it's just really boring, right? Yeah. <laughs> the committees of correspondence, I think, had this really anodyne name for the very reason that they, he wanted them to go on. <laughs> I mean, maybe it's just the below dreariest the name, exactly, <laughs> fly below the radar. Early on, you can see Adams reaching out to Rhode Islanders, um, to other friends in other colonies, asking if they could perhaps put something forward because, of course, the Massachusetts men had such a terrible reputation as radicals. Um, and this is something about which the, the, the Massachusetts delegation will hear as they make their way to Philadelphia in, in 1774. But he's very much trying to, as do other people as well, bring the colonies into the same orbit. And for example, when Boston is occupied, for the other colonies to understand the martyrdom of the poor people of Boston. And he, he makes numerous attempts to have some kind of system, but not until 1772 does he manage to get what he calls these committees of correspondence off the ground. And it's, a, it's an overreach, on, it's an overstep on the part of the crown that essentially allows him to do so. It's the idea that, um, that justices in America will be paid by the crown and not by the colonists that finally gives him the leverage to do this. But essentially these committees are just little groups um, in towns and hamlets initially simply in Massachusetts, ultimately all throughout New England, finally throughout the entire coastline, who are meant to, which are meant to articulate the rights and privilege of, privileges of colonists and to be on the, be vigilant when those rights are infringed upon in any way. And it's an idea at which Thomas Hutchinson scoffs initially, it seems ridiculous. Um, Hutchinson then makes a fiery speech, um, kind of again overreaching in January of 1773, and suddenly the kind of 10 committees that Adams had managed to form become 40 committees and become 80 committees and then begin to spread throughout the colonies. And the end result of those is that after, for example, the destruction of the tea in Boston Harbor, all of these committees are writing back to Boston in the same language with the same biblical allusions, using the same metaphors and in the same language because they have all been communicating. And it's almost as if this is this early version of Twitter where everyone is just retweeting what, what Samuel Adams had originally emitted himself from Boston. And a lot of that correspondence actually is answered personally by Samuel Adams. It's a really, it's a fascinating um, group of letters. So by the time they all roll into town here and are meeting in Carpenter's Hall, I mean, famously, this is when John Adams first laid eyes on George Washington, but so many of these men had been uh, correspondents, but the first time they're seeing one another for the first time in person. Are there any good anecdotes about? You know, <laughs> well, we know so little. I mean, that's the terrifying thing. But what is clear is that, I mean, especially if you get this from the diary of John Adams, there's a certain anxiety. I mean, John Adams was great with anxiety. Um, very articulate on that subject, which maybe is why I like him so much. Um, John Adams is very clear about the fact that they are about to play on a national stage for the first time. And the New Englanders are feeling a little provincial and the Southerners are much more grandiose. And these men have very little in common, interestingly. Um, they don't speak the same language entirely. They don't divide a dollar into the same number of shillings. I mean, it's really, these are people with whom, in some cases, they have corresponded, but whom they have not met, um, despite years of, of letters. I mean, it, this is a point where South Carolina and Massachusetts are communicating via London. So it's really, you know, it's a fairly arm's length relationship. 
and if you and if you read especially Adams's John Adams's diary, you get a sense as um, the New Englanders are making their way slowly um, south to Philadelphia, which they did much less quickly than I did today. Um, that the the environment is getting cooler and cooler to them. You can feel that the political climate is not yet friendly to any kind of idea. They're not bent yet on, on rupture, but even the idea of redress is not really completely in the drinking water as they head their way south. And by friends in most of those middle Atlantic colonies, they are told that they should be patient and they should play a role behind the scenes and they should let the Virginians take over. And John Adams is very clear about the fact that they do precisely that. Samuel Adams is particularly good at working behind the scenes where he's more comfortable anyway and giving the lead role to the Virginians, which John Adams would later say is the reason why the declaration was written by Jefferson and the army was commanded by Washington. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um they come together, they head back home, they're gonna, they set a date to meet the next spring, and then um, something happens on April 19th. Uh, where is Sam Adams when the keg of powder exploded, and how did he feel that day? So, um, you know that there's that moment at three in the morning when you suddenly realize the, the thing you should have realized three years earlier? It, it only occurred to me after a couple of years of research that um, we all have the immortal poems in our mind, of, the immortal verse in our mind of Paul Revere heading off on his horse that night um, to war in the countryside, but I had, anyway, had never thought about where he was going. And where he's actually going is to warn Samuel Adams and John Hancock, who are then in the parsonage in Lexington, that they are about to be arrested by General Gage's troops. And the reason that John Hancock has that impression um, is that that is actually the order that comes to General Gage. This is one of these very messy things in, um, in, in, in American history. Gage's orders, which are sent to him twice, three months apart, are to arrest Samuel Adams and John Hancock. Um, the understanding being that if a few bad eggs could simply be eliminated, this entire opposition effort um, would collapse, which tells you something about how, the, how London saw what was happening in the colonies and how much they underestimate or misestimate the situation. Gage gets those orders, um, which we know because they, they survive, but the order that Gage sends to his men that night is actually not to arrest, that we know of anyway, not necessarily to arrest Adams and Hancock, but obviously to collect the, the munitions in Concord and to upend the kegs and to toss everything into the water and to make sure that everything is destroyed. So it's unclear whether the command that he actually verbally gives is to arrest the two malefactors, but the understanding in Boston um, and the written instruction was indeed to arrest them. So, um, so Revere um, arrives at the parsonage in Lexington, as we all know, um, galloping along, and Adams and Hancock immediately get into a tussle over what they should do, because John Hancock is of the opinion that they should go out and fight, and Adams is of the opinion that they are statesmen and they should be coming to Philadelphia to discuss further diplomatic efforts. Um, and that tussle will last for several hours such that when Paul Revere comes back to the house, he will find the two men still arguing over what they should do. <laughs> um, and, and the British and, were coming. And the British were coming and Paul Revere is able to say, you know, they're a half a mile away and they've also tried to arrest, they've also arrested me this evening, maybe you should now go. And off the two of them rattle in, in John Hancock's coach. Um, and on that occasion, Samuel Adams will show up in Philadelphia in the outfit in which he crouched in the swamp outside of Lexington. So there's the answer to your question about how he felt that evening. It's a very electric moment. Um, you have, you have, we have letters from Hancock and Adams um, on their way when, when they get to New York. And at this point, they have guards outside their doors. They are, you know, they're, they're the heroes of New England in some way at this point, but everything obviously is on the move and everyone, everything has been mobilized. So where, um, I know it has been a matter of endless argument about when Samuel Adams had decided independence was like necessary here. Some push it earlier. I'm just, can you take us on yeah. through those arguments and yeah. where you land on all of with, that? With every biographical subject, there's a, there are a couple of questions that you really want to ask. I mean, I think Ben Franklin should tell us who the mother of his son was. Um, it's time. <laughs> Um, it's, time. it's time. And with Samuel Adams, I think there were, I have two questions. One is who was really the mastermind behind the Boston Tea Party? And my guess is it was Adams and many other people, but I'd like to know who that was precisely. And the other is, when did it become clear that 
redress was no longer possible, but a rupture was necessary. And, and I should go back half a step and say that in the intervening years, through the 1760s, there's an absolute obsession on the part of the crown officers with a conspiracy afoot in America. These colonists are being you know, very insubordinate and they are intent on independence. There's no such movement in America, but there's this sense on the Crown's part that there's a conspiracy. And there is simultaneously a conspiratorial sense on the part of the New Englanders anyway, that the Crown is conspiring against them with various Crown officials like Thomas Hutchinson to relieve them of their rights. So there's this you know, very familiar sense in the air of somebody's cooking up something very crooked. People have generally suggested that Adams comes around to independence in 1768 when those troops first march into Boston. I don't see that in the papers anywhere. Um, certainly, by the time shots are fired, he is very clearly um, not just intent on independence, but thinking it should have been declared the next morning. Um, and he will ultimately, in 1776, say that if it had been declared sooner, Canada would be part of the United States today. So there's a lot of pushing behind the scenes to try to get there sooner than July of 1776, but I would not say that before the 1770s, he's even anywhere near that idea. It's a hard one because none of the founders uses the word independence much before 1775 or 1776. It's far too toxic a word. And it's, everyone realizes that it is the last resort and, and no one is willing to go there on paper. Imagine what prescription drug prices would look like if he had been right about Canada. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to make sure we have some time uh, for questions in the room. And Rebecca, do you, have a, do you have a Zoom question to lead us off with maybe? I do have well, a Zoom. Well, the hands all go up for who's next. Yes. So we'll start with a question on Zoom, and then I will try. I cannot promise that everyone will get their questions in, but we will get as many as we can. Uh, Josh on Zoom is asking, Samuel Adams and Patrick Henry seem to have parallel paths in their own colonies. Do you think that this was accidental, or, do you, or did you find a connection between the two? Um, that's one of those great mysteries. I have no particular insight on that one because there's almost nothing on paper. There's a great deal of rapport of between, obviously, between Dickinson and Samuel Adams, but very little else that, that one can point to. People are grappling, are groping toward the same ideas. It's just that Massachusetts is out in front of the other colonies and Boston is out in front of Massachusetts and Samuel Adams is out in front of Boston. All right. Anyone who wants to go first in the audience? Oh. Make sure we get the microphone so the thank Zoomers you. can hear us. Uh, thank you for your presentation, and I'm curious about how you selected to write about Samuel Adams. You mean that didn't follow naturally from the Salem witch trials? Um, it kind of did, actually. I mean, a, a couple of things came together, and, I, and I'm going to try to reconstruct at least a bit of it. Um, to, a very long time ago, I wrote a book on Ben Franklin, which I was working with again for various reasons. And I realized that I had written Samuel Adams, as most people do, off in a clause. It was, you know, that whatever, we, that firebrand of the revolution, whatever, that ardent patriot. And I, it kind of jumped off the page at me. Like, why had I written him off in this fairly you know, unthinking clause. He must amount to something more. And I started to just look back at what his contemporaries said about him and was immediately struck by how they point to his eminence during these years. And you know, it's like one more than the next speaks to how he was the driving force. Uh, Jefferson calls him the most active, the most, the earliest, the most active, and the most persevering of the patriots. So what did these 18th century men know that we have completely lost sight of? And how did that happen was one of the things that took me back. Then I started reading the papers. There are three or four, I now can't remember, volumes of, of which his great-grandson published of his work. And as I said, these, these anthems just rise from the page. It's very rousing stuff. Oh, and it was 2016, so that really appealed to me because I was, it just felt very important at that moment to be thinking about democracy. Um, and I... And I had realized at the end of the Salem book, I'd done a book on the Salem witch trials, in which I realized that one of the mysteries, other than what, what afflicted the girls and how did this spin so quickly out of control, was how did the trials end? Because it was very hard for anyone to raise a hand and say, this is foolishness, this must stop, this is going to be a stain on New England for the rest of remembered time. And the person who did that, the sort of quiet moral center of the story, reminded me 
for good reason, of Samuel Adams. And so I think there was a sort of sense of feeling that Thomas Brattle, the 35-year-old, who finally and anonymously, quietly spoke up against the trials, was someone of a, of a similar vintage as Samuel Adams. What surprised you the most in your research? I think um, two things, well, many things, but two things off the top of my head. Because I had that idea of the ardent patriot, the firebrand, it was shocking to read these accounts of Adams and all of the accounts align of a man of tremendous discretion, great prudence, refined sensibility, erudition, delicacy, and sweet and sunny temperament. Everyone refers to him as a man of great serenity, which is not at all the firebrand of the revolution. Um, so that really struck me and made sense because he is so persevering. He's a man of a tremendous faith. And I think that obviously that plays a role in his politics, um, but it's, it also explains the tenacity here to some extent. He felt he was on the side of the angels. He wasn't going to let this idea go. Unlike everyone else, he really perseveres. Even when it seems like everyone else has deserted the Patriot cause, he's still the person on the barricades. So the tenacity, I think, struck me um, over and over again. And the fact that this person failed entirely to conform to the sort of comic book version um, that has come down to us. Get my steps in today. You talked a little bit about um, John Adams and Sam Adams, their relationship, and elsewhere, too, there's stories about how they interacted, and people thought they were disappointed when they saw John Adams, thinking it was Samuel Adams, things like that. Did they grow up together? What, what, what other maybe tidbits of information about their relationship that didn't make it into the book, even, about how they got along or didn't? I feel like I could write a whole other book on the relationship between these two. Um, they interestingly don't meet until the 1760s. Um, John Adams grows up in the country, as most of you know, Samuel Adams grows up in Boston proper. And John Adams in a, a fairly rustic and simple environment, Samuel Adams in a very sophisticated urban environment. And so when John meets his cousin, older cousin Samuel, he's starstruck, um, partly because it's a more rarefied world to which he's come, partly because Adams is so much better versed in what's going on politically. There's one moment where um, John Adams goes to find, he can't find Samuel anywhere in town, and finally he does, and Samuel takes him to the, to the office of the Boston Gazette, and you can just feel the astonishment in John Adams. Like, this is how politics works, a bunch of guys sitting around putting out a newspaper and making this stuff up. I mean, he's just, he's completely in awe of his older cousin. Um, and he will very much be, I mean, they're, they're very, they work in very close, um, association for all of these years. I'm, I'm really quite certain that it was Samuel who asks John to represent the soldiers where they appear to be on opposite sides, but Adams had arranged other defense attorneys, so I'm fairly certain he would have arranged everything. There's a fascinating moment when one of Samuel Adams' great innovations that I didn't talk about is, a, is a, an oration every year after the Boston Massacre. So March 5th in Boston for the years after the massacre and until the 4th of July begins to be celebrated is a day of great solemnity where everyone comes out for this very lachrymose, very elaborate oration on essentially the martyrdom of these Bostonians. And one year, it's three or four years after the massacre, Samuel Adams tries to get John to deliver the oration, which was a genius maneuver because, of course, this would be getting the person who had got the soldiers exonerated to speak to the fact that these soldiers had murdered Bostonians. And you have this amazing wrangle between the two cousins where John says, I'm too old, I'm too, you know, I can't do it, I'm too tired, I'm too old, and moreover, that was the most hideous assignment of my professional life, I'm not going to do, you know, I get spat at in the street for doing this, don't make me do this. But you can feel Adam's Samuel Adams twisting John's arm in that, in that encounter. They will, not, not long after the Continental Congresses, they will begin to switch roles, which is to say John becomes more eminent, and Samuel begins to fade into the background, as he does after independence, to the point where when John Adams is sent to France to annoy Benjamin Franklin, um, he will be mission accomplished. Mission accomplished a thousand times over. He will be introduced as you know Mr. Adams, and people will be in awe of him, and he'll have to say, no, 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 that's a different Mr. Adams. And of course, nobody believes him. But he's but he just he. But at that point, they all think he's Samuel, and so John really eclipses um, his cousin in the years to come. I want to ask. 
Is this on? I want to ask a little bit more about the Boston Massacre because uh, what we tend to know is uh, Paul Revere's uh, print of that, which we look at it and see, well, you know, those are pretty nasty soldiers. And what you portrayed was, was very different, like your representation of events was obviously very different from what Paul Revere represented. So I was curious about your discovery and how, you, and how difficult it was to get to a point where you felt you were representing what actually happened that night, which was presented by so many people in such divergent terms. Um, so there's a f fabulous amount of material on the Boston Massacre. It's interesting to compare the massacre with the Boston Tea Party. Because the massacre, we have these 92 or 96, I now don't remember, depositions, as well as a lot of other material. The Boston Tea Party, thousands of people witnessed it and nobody saw a thing. So it's, it's interesting because you don't know what happened at the Boston Tea Party, but we know too much. It's funny, you can't get to the truth either way is what I'm trying to say. You have too many accounts in the first place and too few eyewitness accounts in the second. Um, but from these accounts and from even really the best testimony is what John Adams extracts from people in the courtroom. And if you read those, that testimony, you really understand that these soldiers were pinned against a wall. They had no room to move. They were being pelted with every object imaginable and ice shards and oyster shells. It is not this bedraggled bunch of huddled colonists on one side of the, of the engraving as we remember it and a bunch of ferocious redcoats firing directly into the crowd. These men were terrified. Um, and that really very clearly comes out in the testimony. The interesting thing is that you can see the evolution of Paul Revere's engraving. He borrows someone else's engraving or steals Pelham's engraving depending on how you look at copyright, um, which didn't exist. But he's, in, he's in, implicated in, his, in Revere's engraving the customs commissioners, which was a Samuel Adams obsession. So it does seem as if Adams helps to not only shape the narrative that night, but to add to the cast of malefactors by putting the customs officials in, in making sure the customs officials end up in Paul Revere's engraving. That engraving was so, as we know from media images today, what you see on the screen is impossible to forget. And that engraving had to be kept out of the courtroom because it had already made such a deep impression on people's minds. And it, that was a very hard thing to do because that was all anybody could, after the fact, that was all anybody really could visualize. Hi, I'm curious about your process and how you write, um, how you formulate a book like this and what that goes into for you. And was that affected by the Pulitzer Prize, knowing that every book you're gonna read or write is always gonna have Pulitzer Prize author on it. Do you, you think they get to the point where they just don't put that on anymore? Um, no, I think it was affected by the epidemic. Um, I think I spent a lot of time buying Purell online when I should have been reading the papers of John Hancock. Um, so the process is that I usually spend a couple of years exclusively researching because I don't really know what's out there and therefore I don't know what kind of narrative I'm, how, how much I'm going to have and where the material is and therefore what kind of narrative I'm writing. And I'm, I'm one of the few, most of the people I know are smarter than this. They write biography in, as they go, as they're researching. I just don't know how to do that. Um, and I've never done it that way. But for example, I, I, there, there are always places where you find you have tremendous amounts of material and places where you have much less material. And you don't know that until obviously you've researched the entire book. And your, your sense of both your subject and of the political climate really evolves the more you're reading. So for example, um, when I started, I, I think I said to Joe Ellis, the historian, I'm gonna read all the Boston newspapers for these 15 years. And he said, I'll see you in 20 years. And so I read only the Boston Gazette and the Boston Evening Post from basically 1764 and through 1778, I think. And that took quite a long time, but, what it gives you is the flavor of Boston, the taste of Boston, the smell of Boston, how much an umbrella cost in Boston, what a slave sold for in Boston, who was suing whom, and a tremendous dose of, obviously, the political climate. So that I was able to figure out some of the Adams pseudonyms. I was able to see how much company Adams had on the page in terms of um, similar literature. And I was able to see how people were um, we're finessing the narrative, how something like the Boston Massacre would be represented in the press at different times, when what didn't get into the press is also really interesting, obviously. Like the Journal of Occurrences pieces, which have encounters, of course, none of which happened, so those are not in the press. Um, 
so I do that, and then I, then I finally start writing. And, and usually that's a, a process where you're writing and then you suddenly realize there's something you failed to research or where you need to know more and you end up going back into the archive. And so I'll, re I'll really read the primary sources at least twice, once as I'm going and once to start. But for that sort of year and a half or two years that it takes me to write a book, um, I'm a very cranky person if I have to leave my desk. I like to be able to not be interrupted for anything, especially shopping for Purell. Um, and, and or not, giving book talks. Exactly. And not, and not go anywhere unless I have to head back into an archive. And every once in a while, you're, you know, you're on that course and a new archive opens or a new cache of papers comes um, into your hands. And in this case, I should say there was one silver cloud, I guess, to the pandemic, which was that um, there were certain archives into which I probably would have fled because anything is preferable to writing, and I couldn't get into them because they were closed. So that might have been a mercy. I had finished, the, I had finished my work in London. I had finished my work in Boston. I wanted to read through all of the papers of General Gage, which are in Michigan, and it, it never happened. So our final audience question we're going to take from Zoom. Um, and I think this is a very interesting one to, to, for this evening. If there had been no Samuel Adams, in your opinion, would there have been a revolution? Well, I don't think any of us would, would write the revolution down to one man. Um, so yes, of course there would have been a revolution at one point or another, but I think the timetable arguably might have been different because what Adams does on so many levels um, is to make sure that the temperature is raised. And as I said, the tenacity, I mean, the ability for him to not drop the ball when everyone else had dropped the ball, to continue, I mean, after the Boston Massacre trials, for example, everyone else is exhausted. Nobody wants to continue litigating these things. Everyone wants life just to go back to normal. And it's Samuel Adams alone for those four months who's writing this very explosive material in the press. He's just not going to let this go. And he's waiting for the next British misstep. And I should say that so much of this is a matter of British missteps, not American genius. I mean, there's so many moments here which are really just the fault of the crown, um, who have no idea, for example, where Philadelphia is. Is it in the East Indies or the West Indies? No one was certain. And so to that ignorance and condescension, I would write down the American Revolution more than I would to Samuel Adams. Me? I get to ask a question? Yeah. All right. I'd like to take us into the realm of public history since we're sitting in a museum and I know you do, you do so much uh, with um, other institutions, Mount Vernon, the Carpenters Company, uh, et cetera. We have a big anniversary coming up in 2026. I heard about that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully we'll get it organized by then. Um, and um, I'm just curious, your, you know, sort of what you see as the uh, opportunity, what your hopes are, what you know, when we all wake up in 2027, um, is there an opportunity that's before us um, to change lives through history, hopefully in a good I think direction? you just asked me to do your homework. <laughs> um, you know, I, I'm still naive enough to believe that if you could just kind of put civics back in schools, we'd all be in much better shape. Um, so, you know, I... You, you cannot read anyone's, Franklin's papers, Jefferson's papers, Adams's papers, without getting a full dose of democracy rests on precisely two things, some sort of moral rectitude and education. And I just feel as if if you could somehow figure out a way to get the facts of a revolution out there, it's not real, this doesn't have to be relitigated entirely to my mind, it's fairly simple history, then I think you'd be making a huge stride forward. But over to you to do that. Well, I think you uh, create the raw materials that we work with, you know, bringing these characters to life. I think our lived experience here at the museum, um, you know, I often say to people, if you're feeling depressed about the future, come and walk through the museum with a group of fifth graders and hear the questions that they ask, um, the sophistication of, of the way they engage with history when it's presented as the experience of real people, people in predicaments. And so thank you for all you do to, to um, you know, bring these characters to life. Washington's tent is all I say to you. <laughs> I can't believe you've been here before, but you saw Washington's tent for the first time today. So you're coming back for the exhibit, I know. With pleasure.
good. Thank you, Stacey Schiff, Thank for you being very with much. us tonight. Thank you.